We got a big ass rainstorm over the weekend, dumping about four to five inches of rain on us. So I'm thinking the rainy season is just about back in full swing. I got a little bit more leeway to be able to work on adding in some more beds, not having to work, worry about irrigation because of that. So today we're gonna go ahead and dig out a new bed, show you guys the whole process that we've been doing from start to finish, finally, because we finally have this full system established, to show you guys how to build soil without using any type of fertilizer or anything like that. So you guys, welcome back to the channel and letting me show you that I actually kind of know what I'm doing. One of the hard parts about building soil has been just trying to keep everything protected. We've got a lot of issues with things like squirrels and stuff that come through the property. And so in order to kind of help protect everything, we've been keeping our eye out for a while for a new cat. You might have seen our other cat, Jackie, the black one on our channel before. She's very tiny. She's only about five and a half pounds and full grown, about two years old at this point, I think. And so clearly too small to be let outside and be able to be our little pest control cat for the garden. She works great inside, but not going outside. So we picked up Joey Luciano right here. Joey was actually a cat we've been looking for for a while. We haven't been able to find a kitten that would work for us. We found Joey on Craigslist. Um, somebody had found him inside the engine of a car, uh, inside the engine bay and cleaned him up and didn't was looking for a home for him and we took him in. Clearly you can see he's pretty feisty. <laughs> and so we're hoping that'll be a good indicator that he'll help us out with the yard quite a bit. Hopefully he'll be a good size and we'll put him out there and let him chase all the squirrels and everything like that so that we can have our garden protected as much as possible without using any type of um, bait or poisons or anything like that. Obviously with us having dogs, we do have, you know, red, not red tail hawks. Uh, they're actually, I think red shoulder hawks that nest on the property, other birds and things like that, that we don't want to accidentally poison as they eat those animals that can be an issue with pest control stuff. And so the cat, helps us take care of the things that we want without pos posing too much of a risk to the natural wildlife around us, which is a big part of what we try and do with everything we do, just like in building our soil without using any type of chemicals to poison other things around us. See the kind of common theme? Anyways, so this is Joey. He's gonna grow up and eventually work his way to being outside and protecting the garden. So let's get out there and show you the rest. Right outside the kitchen garden here, we're gonna be putting in some artichokes. They're a perennial vegetable, so they actually come back year after year. I want them in a spot. I have the seeds that I got in Utah. I was actually planning on planting out there. So I brought them out here with me. They're an Italian uh, purple globe artichoke, I believe. And since they're a perennial, they'll be here forever. So I want them in a spot where they'll work really good. That's why they haven't gone in the kitchen garden with all their other vegetables that are back here behind me that you've seen. Those vegetables, some of them have struggled because a lot of the soil that we have, we haven't been able to build quite as well as we're going to be able to with this bed. And I wanted to hang on to the artichokes until I knew exactly where I wanted them to go and exactly that I was gonna be able to build the soil very well to set them off right. So now that we're at the point where I can show you guys exactly how we've been building our soil, exactly what our system is starting to look like, it's a pretty exciting day. So I'm gonna show you actually perfectly with these banana and papaya right here, exactly what I mean by the difference that compost makes for your plants, whether it be fruit trees or vegetables, it makes a huge difference. Come on over here, I'll show you the bananas and papaya. I've talked about these bananas and papaya quite a bit in these videos now. Um, we've had them for a little while. They haven't grown a whole bunch until recently because we finally have the compost that I was using in the compost bin from our very first video. I've been making it for a while, finally had it to the point where I could use it. And that's kind of what you're seeing right here on the top. I left it like that so you guys could see. I'll go ahead and um, I've got a bunch of sticks and logs and everything getting ready to go into the wood chipper to turn into mulch that'll go over the top just like you're seeing on the papaya right here already, but I left it exposed on the banana so you can see exactly kind of what it broke down into. So it's real black, real, um, there's a lot of big heavy stuff in it still, but it's actually, it's really black. It's really rich. Um, even though it's still very big pieces, it's not completely broken down. It's working like a charm. Uh, you could see it when I watered it in the first time, it's coming out almost like black, like coffee or black tea, it was so thick, uh, just soaking into all the plants and it's running down into a 
this bed right here a little bit, which is great for those, but the bananas and the papaya have really taken off. We had this big rainstorm that came in, dumped about three to five inches of rain, or actually more like four to five inches of rain over the weekend. And these three trees that all got the good compost in right before it have just exploded ever since. The trunks on like the papaya have really thickened out and they've gained quite a bit of height and compared to a lot of the other plants that haven't had any compost on them. And so it's great that these are all in this area right at this time to show you guys kind of a comparison because you'll see like this banana right here, this is a Namwa and you can see how thick the trunk is right now and how tall it is compared to this double Mahoy banana over here that's actually been in the ground longer, hasn't had the compost added to it, has had a little bit of food scraps added to the top, but not much. And you can see just the drastic difference. Like this, this banana I think is about three months longer in the ground than that Namwa. And it, the Namwa was only given compost quite recently. And I mean, even though this one's putting out additional pups, the plant itself hasn't grown as much. Um, so we gotta take these pups out of here as well. And the truly tiny bananas, always as ever, I still need to propagate those out. Always seems like something I have to do. <laughs> um, but anyways, so you can see the difference that the compost makes on them. And that was just with that tiny little barrel down there that we had. Um, and so there wasn't a whole bunch of compost that could be made and that was an issue So we have a whole different thing going on further down here for even more compost So we'll take you down this way show you what I've been getting into Clearly the barrel isn't cutting it just with the size and amount of plants that we have for how much compost we need so one of the solutions that we've come up with is I started creating another compost pile out here in the back that was even bigger and it's recently grown a lot. Um, this is all leaves and stuff that I brought over from my neighbor's house. One of my neighbors has been trying to clear out the leaves from her yard and has been needing to try and like rent a dumpster to get them hauled out and so rather than her having to pay a whole dumpster I found out that um, you know, I was talking to her, she said she didn't spray anything in her yard. I've never seen her spray in the almost year that we've lived here. So I went ahead and took all of her stuff for her. Um, and I keep doing that, just picking up her garbage can. She leaves on the side of the, the street so I can go pick them up and get mulch from her, or get the leaves from her that I put in here. Um, you might be able to see the pine shavings on top that are from the chickens when I had them in the tub. It's the last of their stuff with their poop and things on there. So I'm mixing in like a lot of our food scraps, our coffee grinds, and everything from the chickens in here. So you're seeing like the leaves in here that you're seeing, a lot of them too. I mean, I have them all over my property. I could go rake it up, but I have to cut back a lot of this overgrowth in the wood line to get access to it. And I mean, my neighbor's getting rid of it anyways. It's right across the street. I might as well just grab them from her. Uh, she's always gonna have leaves falling and she's always going to have need to get rid of them and I'm always going to have need for the organic matter to try and turn into compost and mulch. So it works great for both of us. Uh, mutually beneficial relationship. <laughs> now, adding in the leaves gives us the browns, which means we need greens and stuff like the chicken poop and um, any type of fresh cuttings like my grass clippings, my coffee grinds, any type of vegetables that we ate but didn't um, fry up in oil and stuff like that we can throw out here. You can compost things like meat, dairy, and things that have been fried in oil, but for, from what I understand the big concern is wildlife gets attracted to the smells and things that get, get emitted from more animal-based proteins and stuff, and so we have a lot of wildlife around our property. We tend not to compost those things because we don't have a fence and the amount of wildlife that's already around our property. And so we use mostly just like our coffee grinds, grass cuttings, and our chicken poop, which has actually been one of the recent things that we've gotten are now outside. So I'll show you guys kind of an update on the chickens too. In the last video we did, we had the chicken coop already up, but we didn't have this run in. And if you saw that video, you probably saw me talk about that. I felt that the uh, chicken coop itself was a little bit more flimsy than I would have liked after we saw it come in from having ordered it online. 
And so we went ahead and put in an additional run just because like I said, we have so much wildlife around our property that I wanted that extra protection for the chickens. We originally had purchased an electric netting to go around the perimeter of the coop and we were gonna use a solar panel to connect to that, provide the electricity, to provide kind of an electric fence to keep the chickens all good from any type of predators. But pricing wise versus putting this in, it was getting even more expensive. And the electric netting, one of the downsides I was feeling personally was that it only had the sides exposed and still left the top open. And with us having so many hawks, like the red-shouldered hawks, we've seen swallowtail kites around our property recently uh, since we're in their breeding season. We keep not getting those on camera. It's really frustrating, but they're so cool. Find them on Google or Olivia post a picture in here to show you guys kind of what they look like, but they're amazing. We wish we could get them on camera. We keep trying and they disappear as soon as we see them. They're like UFOs, it's crazy. Um, but you know, providing this whole run in here provides them that additional coverage over the top so that we don't have to worry so much of any kind of hawk or I mean raccoons, squirrels, whatever. Possums can climb in over the top, same with snakes. Um, I mean. Obviously it's not foolproof yet. We still have some additional things to do. I wanna drop in logs or cinder blocks down around the ground area to provide some additional coverage so that it makes it harder for things to dig on the underside as well. So clearly there's still some things to do, but this is much added protection that allows me to feel comfortable putting the chickens outside rather than having them in the garage or in the house all the time and moving them outside. Uh, great timing because they are getting bigger to the point where the tub wasn't working as great at night for them to sleep So like the chickens love having all the extra space to be able to run out here I don't have to keep an eye on them as much to let them have some more space to stretch their legs They're much happier this way. They get out and get to eat all the bugs and things um, Like I said, I'm using a lot of the leaves that are around this area for their bedding right now Just so that I can then scrape them out with the chicken poop mixed in and add it right into the compost pile and to me that makes a much more sustainable source for bedding for the chickens i mean they're essentially descended from pheasants anyways so they're forest kind of woodland fowl by nature even though they're domesticated so the leaves make sense to me to work for them kind of naturally it gives it more sustainable i don't have to spend any money on bedding that way i just break up some leaves throw it in there it, um, it puts in bugs for them to be able to eat as well in my mind and then I just break it down and compost it every two weeks once it's done. That's about how long I'm doing it right now with the size they're at. If, as they get bigger I'll probably have to do it quicker but they love the space having more to be able to roam around and with how big this coop is um, Olivia and I have been talking about it and we think we're gonna get about five more chickens here in the next couple weeks to finish off this coop and that'll be good with the run a uh, good solid 12 for our setup here. I mean, they just seem happy with everything going on and they love being outside, especially Mildred, the one down there that kind of has like the hawk feather pattern to her. I mean, the coloration looks like a hawk to me. So I think she's pretty and she's the well summer and she actually seems to be the best and most excited at getting out and kind of foraging and more free ranging, which is what I've kind of found from what I've been learning about the different breeds of chickens that we've gotten is it seems the well summer is actually considered to be kind of a royalty breed over in the british family i guess there's some possibility that the british royal family uses them a lot in the flock they really like the well summer for their ability to free range and things like that and i've definitely noticed it with her compared to the others like the easter egger and the marin are the others that are better at free ranging but definitely the well summer by far the best so that's enough of the chickens. Yeah. Next. So what I want to do here is essentially I'm creating the outline of the bed with my shovel so that I know kind of the shape that I'm going to be digging out. Rather than just starting in any spot and working out from the middle, I want to create that outline, give it that nice clean shape as much as I can to give it a good look. It keeps things more uniform. Also helps with productivity because you know the exact shape. You don't have odd shaped things. Um, a lot of the time you probably want to use something to mark this out, whether it would be either like a string line or spray paint, anything like that. Um, today though, I just am kind of taking the shovel to it and going around to give you an idea of how that will look. Uh, I'll probably have to 
do quite a bit of tweaking on it, but that's okay. I didn't care to go drive out and find spray paint today since I don't have any, so. What I want to be doing is I'm not really digging very deep. I'm just digging this one time. This is the only time I'm ever going to dig this bed is just the very beginning. And it's just to get things like the grass from when the construction guys were putting in the sod and stuff and just trying to get deep enough, you know, down an inch or two just to get the roots of as much of this stuff as I can so that it doesn't come back any more than absolutely necessary. You'll see you know some of the beds on the property have more grass or more weeds in them than others and that's where we've been more successful about how much stuff we can take out versus in other spots so the more of the stuff you can get out the better because it saves you more time trying to get rid of it all in the long run Right, so the bed's dug out. Now it's time to come through and just rake everything smooth. Um, when you're going through and digging out a bed like this, if you're trying to do something more detailed, like where I was getting this kind of S-curve line along this edge of the bed, it's definitely better to take out less at a time because it's easier to take out more later on than to try and put stuff back if you take out too much. So when you're doing these details, like I said, just make sure you take out a little bit at a time. It might go slower, but that's better. Um, so we'll just go ahead, rake this up smooth it out and then we'll move on to the next part. Now that the bed is smoothed out, we got some of the lines dug out with the shovel. I'll go ahead and dig the last one just to show you guys what I'm doing. But essentially, what I'm gonna do here is the same thing I've been doing on all my beds where I've been adding sunflowers, is I'm gonna take the shovel and you'll see with some of these other lines that essentially what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna kind of find the spot where I want it to go, put the shovel in there kind of at an angle, just about an inch or two into the ground. You don't wanna to go too deep. And then I'm just gonna kind of pull and scrape along kind of the line where I want my seeds to be going rather than digging out individual holes. I'll just dig out a trench and then figure out where I'm supposed to be going. And there we go. Bring it back around here and then down through here to so go ahead and finish it off. And so what I'll do at this point is I've got three different types of sunflower seeds that I'm gonna be bringing in here. I've got two different wet red ones and a white one. The white is an Italian white sunflower. The reds are Velvet Queen and Red Sun. So I'm gonna do kind of alternating rows of like a red, a white, another red, a white, another red, a white, all the way down through this bed, through each of the rows, and then I'll just come back through, kick the dirt back over the top. I don't even gotta bend over, water it in, and that's all it is, really. So I'm gonna go ahead, start planting those seeds, and then we'll come back and talk to you guys about a recap of everything that we've been through and what comes next. So let's get to it. Once 
One thing to keep in mind if you're gonna do this yourself with the sunflowers to try and build your bed, I'm not keeping this in mind because I don't care. They're just there to build the soil and I'm gonna rip them out and put the artichokes in that I want eventually to be permanent. But if you really want the looks, one thing to keep in mind isn't just the color of the sunflowers, but sunflowers actually do grow to different heights. And so that's one thing to keep in mind when you're planting these is playing with the height differences. Like I said, I don't really care for that getting my eye to be able to look across different elevations throughout the planting on this particular bed because it's only gonna be there for a couple months and then I'm ripping it out. But if you want it to look even better and you're trying to do a sunflower bed and maybe you wanna keep doing sunflowers there permanently, that's something to keep in mind. Not just what color, but what type of sunflower and the different height it has. Okay, so the reason we're doing sunflowers in here this time is because sunflowers don't actually need a whole lot of attention. They're kind of like a pioneer species where they don't need a lot of soil requirements. They don't need a lot of nutrients. They can handle drought really well. Um, and so what we'll end up doing is use those to have the sunflowers grow in this bed. When they're finished growing, I will then cut them down, leaving the roots in the soil. The roots will then get eaten by different bugs, broken down through different bacteria, mycelium, all different kinds of things that will break down those roots to be organic matter back into the soil. While the stalks, I will just go ahead and cut down, lay right where they are, and they'll end up being the mulch for this bed. So I'm not even going to bother mulching it this time. I'm just going to leave it with the sunflowers because they're that kind of pioneering species and then I'll come back through and do it again with the, uh, I'll do the mulch as the chop and drop from the sunflowers themselves rather than having to go out and find mulch. So if you're having issues with things like finding mulch, this might be a great way for you to have mulch as a chop and drop method. Um, I'm using these types of sunflowers here. I don't know how well they'll work for my environment. Obviously different things work better for different environments. I do have another type of sunflower on the property called Mexican sunflower. That's really common out here in our area of Florida. I mean, we can drive around and find them on the sides of the road. They're very easy to propagate from cutting. So if you see those, just grab them, uh, take a cutting as long as it's not in someone's private property stick that in the ground it'll grow real well for you and be lots of mulch material for you down the road as you're building out your gardens like a lot of the reason that olivia and i are doing the stuff that we're doing came from the whole stuff with covid and just you know having food shortages and stuff that we were seeing in our grocery stores and being concerned of how we take care of our family because you know out in utah where we had the food shortages, didn't matter how much money we had. If you can't buy the food because the stores don't have them, then the food doesn't mean it, or the money doesn't mean anything. So we just kind of wanted to have a house where our biggest goal was to have a spot where it didn't matter what happened outside the walls of our house. We just aren't really affected. And that's kind of what we're working on here and why we're striving so much for sustainability. Even though we're taking a few shortcuts and not pushing hardcore right off the bat and going all in, that's still what we're working for. One of the cool things about sunflowers too is sunflowers actually have the ability to purify the soil that they are in. So they can take out different types of toxins and stuff. I forget exactly the full details on them. You'll have to hit Google, but, but to give you an idea of how important sunflowers can be to helping create good soil, um, from what I understand in doing research on sunflowers, I came across at one point that apparently they use sunflowers out in Chernobyl to help clear up some of the radiation after um, the issues with the nuclear facility out there. So, you know, if you've got issues with things like different types of chemicals, um, pesticides, herbicides, whatever type of stuff that maybe somebody used on your property that you got or you've used before and didn't know and now you want to try and flush a lot of that stuff out of your property, sunflowers might be a good thing to take a look at. So sunflowers are really good for bees. Like, yeah. Isn't that like one of their favorite things? Yeah, absolutely great for the pollinators. And so, you know, when you're working on your garden and you're wanting to grow food, not just the soil, but the pollinators play a very important part into how much food you're going to get back. And so the more you know, if you want to plant the vegetables and the fruit trees and stuff, we also want to plant the flowers for the bees, the butterflies, and all the stuff like that. Um, our next video we're doing, I've actually been finding 
some native plants in the wood line I've been clearing out that we're going to show you guys in the next video that are beneficial for some of the native wildlife. Rather than chucking them out, I'm going to be moving some of those plants and talking to you guys about some of those plants, why they're beneficial, and why you should not just slash and burn wood lines for agricultural purposes. So definitely make sure you hit that subscribe button, turn notifications on, so that when that video comes out, you can check that out as well. That's it, all the sunflowers are in the bed. So a quick recap on how to build soil. The main things you need to do first, dig out the bed, and then go ahead, take out all that grass, all the stuff that's in there. Just go down a couple inches to get the roots out, scrape the bed to get it nice and even, and then go ahead and plant. When you're planting, you wanna use a kind of pioneering crop like a sunflower that'll allow you to get roots in there and start getting organic material in there. And then you can just chop it as it gets bigger to lay it down as mulch to keep adding organic matter in there. Once that's done, you can run chickens through this area to help mix that all in together even better, add their poop things like that and then that's it you don't have to dig the bed ever again guys I know it looks like a ton of work I was out here for two days went through like six bandanas because I was sweating so much it's like I'm swimming out here I've changed clothes a lot in this video I swear it took a lot of work to get this done I'm not gonna lie it's been like 90 degrees and 60 to 100 percent humidity depending on the day here in South Florida it's a lot but I only have to do this once and now that it's done, I don't even have to worry about going out and buying fertilizer, buying compost, buying any type of additive to the soil. I can make it all right here using the organic matter at my house to build mulch, compost, using chicken manure for fertilizer, all that kind of great stuff like that. So with everything going on in the world, right now there's a lot of fertilizer shortages, a lot of food shortages coming up. It's all in the articles, everything you see. And so it's a great time to start looking for how to do things more sustainably, how to build your soil kind of that permaculture way. And that's why I'm glad I found guys like Jeff Lawton who I could learn from and try and use this property as the practical application of trying to apply everything that I'm learning from watching guys like him. So definitely try this for yourself if you're feeling like it's something that looks a little daunting and a little extensive i hope i showed you by using a shovel myself that you can do it with bare minimal equipment and bare minimal resources um, anyways definitely check back for the next video we do like i said with the follow-up talking about some of the native plants to take care of the native wildlife and the importance of pollinators as always don't forget to smash that like button if you enjoyed the video hit subscribe to your notifications on so you don't miss the next video catch you next time Omar, out